So I have it, thank you. Let's click on the right place. Uh, yeah, it was a, a joke, a bad joke, sorry. So I'm not from the trenches, we're not doing tricks. We're actually in a nice office in Lausanne selling uh, cloud computing. And yeah, if you have watched uh, RST development, yeah. So there are going to be no tricks, no whores, no, no worries. <laughs> so what we're going to talk today, I will move over there because there are people hiding back there. How we solve some of our problems using in Go, using uh, annotations, instruct, hiding fields to hide some metadata, embedding structs, doing type aliases, and for the last part, very hard stuff to do static analysis on code. So in your pouch, you got one of those cards with 20 euros on it. You can spawn servers, so don't do it all at the same time because I know people in the Lausanne office are gonna freak out. But on your own time, in your own schedule, just give it a try. So what we do, we sell VMs, basically. Also object storage, which is S3 compatible. You have to. And we have some GPU servers, as well as other services like DNS, private nets, elastic IPs, and so on. So about myself, we did a photo shoot for the conference, and so I sent the serious picture, and this is the other one. Uh, I'm from a front-end development background, I'm not really Go or sy system stuff. And at Exascale, I'm doing Go and Clojure, which are totally different worlds, and I'm actually enjoying all of them. And where we are using Go, we have, in the spirit of eat your own dog food, we have a Terraform provider to spawn machines on our infrastructure, and we are using it ourselves. So I better not do bad stuff there. We s there's a feature called Elastic IP where you can assign an IPv4 to many machines, and the traffic is load balanced, run robinly around them. There's a little agent you can install on the machine, so they check around them to kill one. So if another machine disappears, the IP is not rooted there anymore. So this is also written in Go. And I'll stop turning my head. The, and some internal stuff, the, all the networking layer, so more sys, system uh, code is done in Go. So all the networking, when you spawn machines, they appear like they are in the same network if they add literally wires behind them, between them, even though they are in different IPvRs, IPvRs, and so, so this is done in Go, the old VXLAN layer, and the agent on the IPvRs would communicate with the main system, is also done in Go. And what we're gonna show tonight is the CLI, which is brand new and exciting. So once you've registered and used your code, you will very likely see this. This is the web UI. So you can create a new machine. You can you choose one region. We have one in Germany, one in Austria, and two in Switzerland. Historic, historically, we have a Swiss company, but now we got the mother company is A1 Telecom in Austria, so we are expanding towards bigger span in Europe. Mostly German-speaking country, but... So I will demo the CLI now. So be quiet on the Wi-Fi, otherwise I'm gonna have trouble doing it. Thank you. I have to switch. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so
So the CLI is built using uh, Cobra, the same as Kubernetes. There's another one. So what I'm going to do is for the measure, it's yeah the Wi-Fi. Here I'm listing the templates available. When you spawn the machine, you have to choose the, the, the model where which kind of image you want to boot. That's the Ubuntu one. So we will create a new Ubuntu instance. Actually, so what we see here is we've created a private key. It's done on the server. It's you can argue that, and spawn the VM. And now I should be able to connect to it. But by default, everything is closed. So if I try to connect to it, the the default rules are to close everything. So once you've spawned your first VM, you won't be able to access it unless you open some ports. So it's basic security. So it's not going to work. I can wait for hours. Let's kill that. And this machine, do we see? Sorry. Do we see it? Yeah. This is the machine we just found. I have to, yeah, OK. The public IP, and this machine belongs to a security group, which governs what we have the rights to do with it in terms of ingress, ingress. So which ports open, which one are closed. By default, all the traffic that goes there is closed, and all the traffic that leaves the place is open. And this default security group is empty. So I will add a new SSH rule. And there is a super flag, which is my IP, which is going to, oh, I did two there. OK, anyway. My IP will ask a DNS resolver what is the public IP of this place and put a rule for only this. I will remove the other one. Tech. Yeah, M. Sorry. And the firewall. Show. So the default security group has only one port open for this. <coughs> Specific IP. The Wi-Fi here doesn't have uh, any IPv6, so I cannot do it with IPv6. I'm sorry. I wanted to, but. And now, once I approve that, jumped into the machine in SSH. And can install Go. Uh, it's going to be much faster because I'm, I'm over there. I'm not here. <laughs> so in a couple of minutes, we just spawn the machine and start working on it. I'll just destroy it now. And yeah. Go lab. Yes. Yeah. 
Angle VM list. And the GoLab machine is gone. I only have my other machines that I use uh, to go to on RSC. Yeah, sorry. Cool. Well, great. Thanks. So before we had this CLI, we were using the API directly. So the API is, we are running on, it's a cloud stack based uh, cloud platform. So you send HTTP request and you get JSON response. So all the tools we're using in this raw API and in order to use it, you have to be kind of a poor user you need to know the course, you know how to parse things, how it works. So in the good old days, we're still using it, but we had the Python client and this Python client had very low uh, knowledge of what's going on. So the, for example, this is a call. I'm not in the right place. So I'm listing here the, the zones, so where we can spawn machines. But if I do a typo, it's like, oh, panic, because the client doesn't have any, I did have to do wrong place. He didn't tell me. If I do a typo in the call, it panics without telling me that this doesn't exist. He doesn't have any knowledge. And the, the Go library helped us putting more knowledge in it and being more strict because we had to. So my screens. For example, this is an example for, from the blog where we create a load balancer with HA proxy that balances the traffic across the, a couple of machines. And when you, to do that using the API, it's very verbose, you have to know what is what, and you have to create crazy things like that, here and bigger. So you have to kind of build complex URLs. That is quite difficult to do. And in that sense, Go helped us by embracing the types. So all these calls, we created the proper structure for it, for each of them, with the types, with the substructures. So that's that complex URI. In Go, you do this thing. And at compile time, it complains if something's wrong. When we use Python, it doesn't do that. If Python doesn't know much and it breaks at the end. So the first trick <laughs> was to reuse the annotations. If you did already encoding in JSON or YAML or XML, you put those. There. So when you create a struct, you can put some annotations, some labels next to it. So we are using that, them to create the URI from before. To do that, you have to work with that. It's a bit with reflection. So you can expect at runtime what type you're, you've got and what's in there. That is first thing, very easy. Now, the other, for the other trick, the example here is how to create an SSH key pair. When we spawn the machine, the first step was to create the SSH key. So when we, then we connect to it, we use that key. It's not, not a password. So this call, create a key. To use it, we wanted to do that. So you have your, cli your client, you create the request by saying create SSH key. This is the name I want to give to it. I send my request, and if the response is successful, I can extract 
the response with the key pair, private key, and so on. But we had to hide the create SSH key pair somewhere, the name of the call. It cannot be the name of the, the type because callint complains too much. So the idea was to have this hidden field underscore bool there with the name of the call. And this does something, there is an extra bonus to do that. It's from a, an external library. You cannot anymore instantiate substruct by positional arguments because there is one missing always. So you cannot do this structure with three positional arguments, name, account ID, name, account domain ID. You have to always say name, the column, and the name. It's, I don't know if it's a good idea, probably don't do that, but we use it. So that library is called EggoScale, which is a pun. And if you wanna, you wanna Google it, and we use it in our CLI, in the Terraform provider, the Lego Acme, which is used by Traffic or Caddy, so the web servers that gives you a TLS certificate automatically. Yeah. Caddy, yeah. The Kubernetes incubator, uh, external DNS, so in your Kubernetes, you can put annotations with domain names and it registers automatically on Exoscale the domain name for a pod or an application or service. We can do the DNS there. Token machine, even it's a dying project. Now, another thing from the API. If you probably serious JSON, there is this thing that is strange. You parse a MAC address, you get this type from the Go standard library, and then you encode in JSON, and it gives that string back. You don't have the, the MAC address anymore. Does anyone have a solution to fix that? An easy one. I'll give it to you. So people coming from the Java like, yeah, okay, I wanna get derive that and but we don't have inheritance in Go. So we're gonna solve that using all techniques. One solution is to create an alias. So the network hardware address from the standard library, we alias it with our own type. So we create our own MAC address, and now we can override the JSON marshalling. So now when we JSON it, we're gonna obtain what we want. That's handy. But sometimes it doesn't, there's another solution. When you do that, you have to implement all the calls. Like I had to redo the string, to redo all the calls that this type had and you still want to keep. You don't uh, get all the methods that that type had in the past or already. So when you do this alias, you don't get the string from the MAC address. You have to redo it. The other solution is to embed the type you wanted to recreate. I will do a demo for that. Uh, no, let's, let's show. So here we create our own table, but this table in embeds another table. It's not an alias of the other library. 
So we can change some behaviors of it. We don't have to redo everything. We can just change what we want here and there. And what we did is for the, I will show it. It's going to be much easier. So exo zones. Yeah. It doesn't look like it, but it's a fancy output here with the big, ah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. It's the fancy output with the characters from the UTF-8 char. And when you pipe it to something, you get a markdown compatible output. So the original library didn't have that. We didn't want to create a fork or uh, change it. or So we just monkey patch it in one place. We wanted that little feature somewhere, and we did, did it there. Yeah, we should have more colors, definitely. And when you do that, the, the very good side of the thing is that you don't have to re redo all the methods. But then it's very hard to create those new tables. When you do the type alias, the before, it's very easy to go from the original one to yours. It's just you do a little casting, and it's OK. Here, it's a bit more, more work. Now we're going to go a bit deeper. So. Have you ever used Golint all day, every day? Probably. The, the Golint is a linter, so it reads your code and finds bugs there, things that are not right on that could be improved. The API we have, we can get the definition from a JSON file. So the goal is to use that definition, and the Go code to see if the two matches. If we have uh, corresponding documentation, errors, names, if we are missing some fields, here and there. And this little script reads the JSON, reads the Go code, and tells us where we have mismatches. Sometimes we want to keep those mismatches because there's bugs here and there, or things are unclear. So if you ever want to do that, since Go 1.5, the runtime and the compiler are written in Go itself. So Go has all the libraries to parse and generate Go code. You can import everything to read Go files and play with them. And it's quite easy. I had to go in some libraries to see how it was done, but it's not that frightening. The first thing is to find all the Go files you want to create the abstract syntax tree from them. If you still have that from the university time in your mind. And at the end, we have a big bag of files. Abstract syntax tree of all the files we have. Now we can query what we want from them. Here, all I need are the definitions. So every time a variable is instantiated, a type is created, a package, everything, we'll get all that. And the last part, you go through all of them. And whenever I have a struct, I check if this struct is a query from our API. And if it has all the fields the API has, if the documentation is the same, if the name is the same, the type is the same. So we automated the check of the code. And it could look like that. 
So this call, the domain ID field has not the same type as in the official source from the, the server, the backend server, so it's not the same. It says it wants a UID and in our code we put a string. And the other one is an int and here we have an enum. And that's probably okay, probably what we want. So they are false positive. The other library to speak with CloudStack is called Go CloudStack, and it does, his whole code is generated. So there is one little file that reads that JSON and generates 80,000 lines of Go. It's arguable, it works for them. We prefer to do, to go the more, uh, to only do the checks and not the generation because of the names that are hard to, it's hard to go from the Java name they picked there to the Go friendly names with the capitalization and ID in all caps, stuff like that. Before the end, I want to just throw you out some tools we are using. So the previous presentations spoke about some tools. We are not doing using the same, so different experiences. We are also using linters, so Go Mental linters worked well for before Go 111. Now we prefer to use the Go Long CI. So every time we do a push in Travis, it runs all the checks. It's very useful. To produce a release, a Debian, RPM, source code, Mac OS 6 every, everywhere. It's Go Releaser. He say, yeah, write make files. It's another solution. Godoc. And the CLI is built on Cobra. And we had another CLI built on your fav CLI. It's a different tool to do CLIs. And they are they take very different approach. So try them all and see what works for you. And that's the end of the talk. Here are many links. Now you're free to create some VMs. And I'm happily going to take your questions. Yeah, then. Thank you. Don't be shy. <laughs> so you mentioned that you change the output uh, if it's being piped to another command from uh, to the table-based output to markdown. Is there any particular reason why markdown? Is that easier to process by other programs? It's easier to put in a GitHub issue and say, oh, I, I had this output and that's not why I expected. I see, I see. Yeah? I can repeat it. Um, what was the reasoning why you picked that uh, table writer instead of the well known tab writer like popular tools like Cubes, CTL, etc.? Yeah. Uh, I prefer TabWriter, and the person who worked on it liked to have borders, and I think TabWriter is more, uh, we use it somewhere, but yeah. The, uh, who uses it? VM show. No, it's not tab writer. We have some tab writer there. That's tab writer. Yeah. 
So in the standard library, there is a, a way to produce tables easier than the one we are using. Not as fancy. But. So if you have anything else, we are by the booth with Stefano. He's Italian, so if you don't want to speak English, you can talk with him. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jan. <laughs>